Good afternoon, good evening. My name is Herbin. I'm an alcoholic. Welcome to our big book telephone Zoom workshop. This call is being recorded. Please join me in prayer for an open mind and open heart. God, please set aside everything that I think I know about myself, my brokenness, the 12 steps, and you for an open mind and a new experience of myself, my brokenness, the 12 steps, and especially you. Please join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. We've been deep into step one. We spent quite a bit of time on it. And we do so because it's the foundation. We try to, at least from my efforts, dig a big foundation hole to fill it with knowledge, certainly, but more especially experience. I'm really stressing that part during this part of step one. We've been looking at addiction as the first half of the first step. The big book actually addresses alcohol because they had a limited view at that point based on their own personal experience and need and source of suffering. It was alcohol. Bill wrote the book Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the title of the book. But he had the foresight, really, uh, the prophetic insight in that preface to the first edition in 1939, April, where in the very first paragraph, he said, our way of living may have its advantages for all. Oh, he's writing it for alcoholics, clearly. But he had this instinct, this inspiration this intuition from the depth of his literary writing as he introduced the big book. But it is possible that this methodology of the 12 steps might have much broader appeal and effectiveness than just alcohol. And that's why you're the invitation for these workshops is y'all come if you have any form of addiction. And even if you don't have any addiction, if you have any form of human suffering, y'all come. Participate in this work, this workshop, this methodology. Applying these personal steps to our individual lives. And I've never seen it fail. Bill doesn't talk about, quote, foundation, close quote, as the first step. But when he gets to the second step, he says the second step is the cornerstone of a spiritual arch through which we walk to a new freedom. So by deduction, in terms of a completion of that metaphor or that model, we don't build a spiritual arch through which we walk to a new freedom and place it on quicksand. We place it on a very solid foundation. The first half of the first step, as I've indicated, is about addiction. That's where we're at right now. We've looked at the first part of that, what's wrong with my body, 
when I start, I cannot stop. We're very clear from our own experience and an understanding of Dr. Silkworth's opinion that there's something biologically different for an addict. We're abnormal by definition, we're not normal. It's not a pejorative term, it's not a put down, it's not a moral judgment, it's not a judgment of any kind of negativity. It's an observation of fact. Normal people stop when they've had enough, or at least once they've had an experience of not stopping, they're able to stop because they learn from it. And then that brings us to the second component, which is what we're looking at right now, the problem of the mind. A problem that although we're able to stop and have stopped many times and some periods, long periods of time, we don't stay stopped. It's funny when I have conversations with people, they say, well, no, it was successful. I stayed stopped for two years. Um, and I just point out, yeah, yeah, that, you're talking about past tense. So you didn't stay stopped. Well, I did for two years. I know I did is the key verb here, past tense. It didn't work. I don't care whether it was two days or two weeks or two months or two years or two decades. If you didn't stop, you didn't stop. Step back and get the perspective of your own personal history when you're looking at your journey, not just a particular cycle or episode or period of time. Look at your entire life history and then answer the question, did I ever stop and stay stopped for a period of time and start again? So Bill says the problem is in the mind. And he gives us lots of examples on pages 23 to 43. And we've taken a look at the key example that illustrates obsession and delusion, the, the, t the two key points here in this material. He said there's something wrong with our mind, and throughout this material, we've identified two key words, obsession and delusion. Obsession is the thought. It's a, a thought, a special kind of unique thought that fills up the vision of our screen so that there is no other thought. We cannot see any other thought because that's the only thought that we can see. And we don't know it's the only thought because it's the only thought. That's, that's not, I'm not trying to be cute or tricky. I'm trying to describe this phenomena of an all-encompassing thought that is so prevalent that there is no other awareness. And the problem with the thought, it's a lie, it's a delusion, it's false. Many of you have talked about it. It will be different this time. And you truly believe it. It never has been different in the sense that you meant it better or at least manageable. It's always different in the sense of progressively getting worse but we don't connect the dots. We don't see the truth. We don't remember to remember. We cannot put the puzzle pieces together. We don't even know that there are puzzle pieces. We don't even know that there's a picture that we're not seeing. And I say it poetically, trying to capture my own experience with it because it boggles my mind every time I talk about it. I didn't know that I didn't know. And I couldn't see that I didn't see. And Bill gives us the story of Jim the car salesman. Pages 35 to 37. And we looked at his detail of the story. Six times he goes to the insane asylum when he drinks and he knows it. And he knows the problem of alcohol because a couple of people showed up and explained it to him. And in fact, explained it so well that he 
perhaps weren't those steps and had the promises and his life was coming back together again, and he drank. And the reason in the book for his relapse was he failed to enlarge his spiritual life, and we looked at that in a different place in the big book, in Bill's own story on page 14. It says he failed to enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, and now we know what he meant. We know then the rest of the story with regard to Jim, the car salesman that put a little whiskey in his milk. And Bill uses the term insanity. It's worth repeating, although I've talked about it at length. It's such a key concept for step one, but it's even a more key concept if, you, if that's correct English. A more important key concept for step two. Where step two says we're restored to sanity, what does that mean? It just means that our mind is restored to a level of proportionate healthy thinking, proportionate healthy thinking. And Bill defines insanity on page 37 as a lack of proportion and a lack of the ability to think straight. Insanus, unhealthy thinking. This is the obsession. My mind does not work like it was built to work. To think in proportion, common sense, to remember, to remember, to think in a healthy way for my own survival. That's really what it is. It's a survival tool of my mind, as are my emotions, as are my senses. They're survival tools digesting our perception of reality so that in fact we can continue to live and discern threat and avoid danger. But our minds as addicts don't work correctly. I had a 502 in 1968. I'm 28 years old. That's a drunk driving arrest in California. Three years later, 1971, I had another one. Now, fortunately, I had good attorneys and some money. And in those days, it was very like a ticket. And it was reduced. And, and I paid no consequences other than money and a little embarrassment. They didn't do me any favors by that, but I'm just repeating history. And three years later, I end up in a hospital in a single car accident due to alcohol. So over a period of 10 years, I had these three very visible, very expensive, very embarrassing connections to the source of alcohol, and I never once gave it a thought. And I have an academic background that's all geared to self-reflection. A graduate education in philosophy, a graduate education in psychology, a graduate education in theology. What's wrong with me? Well, even coming into the rooms of AA at age 43, I spent four years going to a meeting every day, calling a sponsor every day and never figuring out the answer to that question. And in fact, never even asking the question. So even during four years of freedom from alcohol and a complete immersion, in Alcoholics Anonymous, I read the book, I worked the steps on my own in that first year. Nothing changed. I got no new knowledge. I got no new information. I got no new perception. I got no change in my behavior. Four years sober with the sponsor that I call every day. Now, of course, there's no sponsored training camp, is there? He didn't know that he didn't know much about the big book or the step process or certainly about what is a spiritual awakening and how to precipitate it. And I began to understand uh, the problem of alcohol that first time in 1988 when I went through the steps with somebody who understood it themselves and then had the experience. He explained to me what allergy and craving meant and then had me connected to my experience. But that was it. And I'm saying this because I really want to give you a sense of perspective on the process. It's not an event. It's not a task. It's an experience. 
and it's a process. Three years later, 1991, I did the steps again, and this man took some time with me with what we're talking about, Jim's story and Fred's story. And we met three different times, two hours each time, and we went over the same material because he knew that I wasn't getting it. Oh, I read the language. I understood the words. I had the knowledge, and I could give you the definitions of obsession and delusion. I could describe in detail the differences between Fred's story and Jim's story and how they were the same and what the, pur the purpose of them in the, in the book were. But I just wasn't connecting it to my own personal history when I stopped for 30 days, when I stopped for 60 days, when I stopped for 90 days prior to coming in the program. And I started again. So the, after two visits in which I didn't connect to it, the experience of it, not just the knowledge, but the experience of it, this man spent the next third and the last meeting with me on, on this subject, two hours asking me about my drinking pattern from Sunday to Monday to Tuesday, to Wednesday, to Thursday. No, no, drilling down, bearing down, as you know, and probably have personally experienced me do, very specifically bearing down on you with questions about specificity. I do that because it's what precipitated in me the experience. Certainly a clearer understanding, but then a connection to my own personal history that allowed me to in the deepest part of my soul to be stunned at the reality that I didn't know that I didn't know, to be boggled by the lack of ability to connect the dots even four years sober, even in the program, even after doing the steps and having a spiritual awakening, I did not have an experience with this material that we're going to finish up with tonight until I was seven years sober and doing the work for the second time. We unpacked Jim's story last time and now we're gonna take a look at Fred's story, but there's such an important paragraph above that on page 39, the actual or potential alcoholic with hardly an exception, will be absolutely unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. You see, this whole exercise that we've been in for the last three workshops is about seeing that knowledge and self-knowledge is important. It's just not effective. It's important. We need to know better before we can do better. But because we know better doesn't mean that we'll do better. Think about the structure of step 11. The end of step 11 says, praying for the knowledge of God's will and the power to carry it out. Two very different components. I need to know that I know, and then I need grace to be able to be effective in my exercise of my willpower. The actual or potential alcoholic will be absolutely unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. It's in italics. This is a point we wish to emphasize and re-emphasize. Hello, I'm following literally the suggestion of the book. In the workshops that we've been doing, this is our third one on this material. I am emphasizing and re-emphasizing, hopefully smashing home upon each one of the participants about their own personal bitter experience. Fred is a partner in an accounting firm. That means he's a very bright guy, very industrious, very disciplined. He's gone to college and now he's done three years of graduate school or two maybe, getting his certified public accountant license or degree, I'm not sure what you call it, training. And because of that, and he spent maybe 20, 30 years with a law firm, with a, uh, uh, an accounting firm. He's done his time. He's got a lot of skills. He's very competent. He's making a lot of money. His income is good. He's got a home. He's got, he's married, family, children, attractive personality, just like Jim, very successful. 
Here's the key to this story. We saw Fred about a year ago in a hospital. Okay, this is Bill and Bob maybe. I've got no evidence for the facts, but I never let the facts get in the way of a good story. All right? I like the story as I tell it. It may be apocryphal, meaning a false story, but the lesson of the story is the point. They're visiting the hospital. Like with Jim, they visited the insane asylum. These are proactive people going out into the field uh, to harvest and heal. Think about that in terms of the profile of sponsorship. Far from admitting that he's an alcoholic, he's here to rest his nerves and his doctor's not even going to tell him the truth he intimated. So this guy, really smart, very determined, very successful, has very strong willpower. He makes up his mind. I don't need the spiritual remedy for my problem. We told him what we knew of alcoholism. Well, we know what Bill and Bob knew of alcoholism, a physical allergy and a mental obsession. He was interested interesting information. This guy's really smart. He got it. He conceded that he had some of the symptoms, but is a far long way from admitting that he is one of them. This humiliating experience and the knowledge that you guys have given me, this is going to handle it. The knowledge that you've given me and my determination to be, never let this happen to me again, that's going to be it. I really understand. Now, this guy really did understand in the second paragraph below that, the second full paragraph in the middle of it, it tells us how deeply this man understood the problem as Bill and Bob had expressed it. I rather appreciated your ideas about the subtle insanity which precedes the first drink. That's very sophisticated language. I don't know very many people in the program today that could have articulated this sentence. The subtle insanity obsession that precedes the first drink. That one to five minutes just before I relapse. What is that? I'm being hijacked by an obsession. The subtle insanity, unhealthy thinking. In fact, on the next page, he coins the phrase, a strange mental blank spot. In contrast to Jim, Jim had some premeditation. He said, I vaguely sense I wasn't being too smart. He had some perspective on his first mixing of whiskey with milk and on the second mixing whiskey with milk. This guy, he didn't see the train coming at all. In fact, on the bottom of page 40, he says, I'm going to exercise my willpower, keep on guard, and I have every right to be self-confident. Very resolute. On page 41, it tells he's a year later, he's in Washington, he's dealt with the politicians, he's negotiated on behalf of his firm, and he's been very successful. His partners are going to be very pleased when he returns home. He goes back to the hotel. It's a perfect day. Maybe it's June in Washington, D.C., and if you've been there at that time, the cherry blossoms are out, and it's phenomenal, balmy. And he goes uh, back to the hotel and uh, cleans up for dinner, and it says on page 41, as I cross the threshold, it's in italics. This is uh, a very important piece of material, the big book's way of highlighting. As I crossed the threshold of the dining room, the thought came to me. Here we go. The thought came to me. It would be nice to have a couple cocktails with dinner. It's a year later of his humiliating experience and his meeting with Bill and Bob and his deep understanding of alcoholism, the subtle insanity which precedes the first drink, and he doesn't see this coming at all. That was all, nothing more. I had a drink. I had a second drink. Fabulous. 
I ordered dinner, I ate dinner, maybe I had coffee, maybe I had dessert. Then I went out for a walk. When I came back from that wonderful June evening, smelling the cherry blossoms, not a care in the world, very successful day. Before I go to bed, I'm going to have a nightcap just to cap it off. Well, he stayed in the bar until it closed. Then he got up, packed, checked out, went to the airport, flew home, stayed in a taxi for three days drinking, and ended up back in the hospital. And that's when he meets these guys again. On the bottom of page 41. I went carefully over that evening in Washington. Oh my God. How could I, after a year of abstinence from alcohol and all the information that I had and all the complete commitment and conviction that I would be on guard and exercise my willpower, and it says here, I had been off guard. I had not made any fight whatever. The time, this time, I had not thought of the consequences at all. There was no other thought on the screen of my consciousness than, wow, I'm very successful. I'm going to have a drink that would taste really good. And he says that's an alcoholic mind. On page 42, what I had learned of alcoholism did not occur to me at all. And here's the words, my favorite, because they describe me, strange mental blank spot. He's just observing it, identifying it. He's not explaining it. There's no science here. This is a metaphor, a strange mental blank spot. Hopelessly defeated. Well, if you paid attention to the story when Jim said he was an alcoholic, they explained to him steps two and the balance of the steps and Jim had a spiritual experience as a result of finishing the advanced process. What Jim didn't do was continue helping others deal with their problem. But here, because Fred doesn't accept or concede that he has a problem, they don't even tell him about the program. They don't even tell him about steps two or anything else. But now it says they grinned and they asked if I thought myself an alcoholic. There's two questions here. Pay attention if you're attempting to help other people. There's two questions here. Are you an alcoholic? Yes, by your definition. And are you licked this time? Do you, are you surrendered? Are you defeated? That's a huge second question. Now he says, I concede both. And they shared their experience, hopeless condition. All right. Then in this last paragraph, once he's, ex he's conceded step one, powerlessness, then they outlined the spiritual answer. God is the power and the program of action. Give your life over to God, the care of God, and do inventory and amends which a hundred of them had followed successfully. By the time this book was written, there were about a hundred people in three cities that had six months of sobriety. The program of action is entirely sensible, but drastic. It means I would have to throw several lifelong conceptions out of the window. Does that sound like the set aside attitude? I think so. The moment I made up my mind to go through the process, I had the curious feeling that my alcoholic condition was relieved. Quite as important was the discovery that spiritual principles would solve all my problems. This is where we're heading with this next assignment. We won't unpack it for next week, but you're welcome to begin it. Assignment number five. We won't look at it next week, assignment number five, but you can begin looking at it. It's worthwhile. It's got very dense paragraphs in the big book in chapters four and five, 
It skips around because it's not Bill's intention in structuring the big book to do what we do with unmanageability, that second half of the first step. Spiritual principles would solve my problem. I've been brought into a way of living, infinitely more satisfying and more useful. Way of living is a code word Bill uses for steps 10, 11, and 12. Further down, he says, what you have said, a general hopelessness of the average addict, 100% hopeless. And then he concludes what Bill thinks is his concluding commentary and his instruction on step one. This is the way the book is structured. On page 43, Bill concludes his approach to step one. But as I'm pointing out, and as you'll see later on, it's really only a conclusion to the first half of the first step. He says, once more, the alcoholic at certain times has no effect of mental defense against the first drink. We need God. We need a higher power. But notice, it's about alcohol. It's about addiction. It's about a substance or process. It's about the first half of the first step, a body and a mind problem. Nowhere in this material that we've been looking at has he treated unmanageability. Not even refer to it. The third time I went through the step work, 10 years sober, 1994, I, I engaged a man who had a different approach. And he's the one that gave me this head aside prayer. And he's the one that took me into a series of assignments on unmanageability so that at the very first time in my sobriety, I was able to have an experience with the spiritual malady, really understanding it for the very first time and understanding why Bill says in the 10th step, we enter the world of the spirit and we're placed in a position of neutrality, but we're not cured. And we have a daily reprieve. That information in step 10 is unintelligible if you don't know what unmanageability means, if you don't know that it's the spiritual malady, if you don't know it's the human condition. And most people don't know that they don't know that in the 12 step program. We'll spend two or three workshops on the unmanageability. But first, we're going to focus on the problem of the mind. If you haven't finished the worksheet on the mind, now would be the time to be doing that by next week, finishing. It's not a test, as I've indicated, to be completed or to get right or wrong. It's a springboard of questions to confront your own personal history. A lot of them surrounding, what were you conscious of? What were you feeling? What were you aware of? One to five minutes before you relapsed, after a period of abstinence, whether it's a one day or a week or a month or a year or a decade, it doesn't matter. Take a look at the specifics on Friday night. I'm at the hula hoop bar and I've got 30 days of sobriety, I'm in AA, or I'm not in AA, but I didn't want to drink, and I made a commitment not to drink, but I'm going there to shoot some pool. You see how specific? I really mean that specific, not a general acknowledgement of the blindness that you saw in Fred or the semi-consciousness that you saw in Jim. No, I want you to get real specific with your at least one, and I hope you can identify three times, either before you came in program or even after you came in program, if you have relapse after you came in program. And unpack it specifically. I made it, I, I, I'm in OA and I've got 60 days of hard, hard one sobriety abstinence by my standards and my sponsor's standards. And I'm at a wedding and I have a piece of wedding cake and it was the forbidden fruit. 
and they call that a relapse. I'm saying it that way because I'm not in the program and I don't want to establish any vocabulary that you know, isn't appropriate. Trying to parallel that with the drinking. What were you thinking and feeling and aware of just before you went for the cake? After you took the bite, it's irrelevant. It's all a story at that point because the craving kicks in either then or later on. So the point is not when you ate it. The point is not when you drank it. The point is not when you injected it. The point is not when you were controlling. No, it's too late. You're already in it. The point is just before you engage in the process or ingest the substance. One minute, five minutes. Those instructions aren't in the big book. They're my way of helping you tease out your experience with it. All right. So we're going to talk to some folks today. Had to really wrestle with what I was feeling. So I've been sober 30 years, but it's really in the food program that, that my addiction shows itself. Yeah. Yeah. So here's, I, I attempted to do what you said. Can I just read it to you? Okay. I said, I received multiple emails from my ex-husband. I read the emails. And Before you do that, give us the context of it. Now, the relevancy of this is a relapse. <laughs> So what are you relapsing from and what kind of support do you have and what kind of consciousness and commitment do you have at this moment? Okay, so I, uh, my conscious, my intention was to not eat sugar, wheat, or flour. <clears throat> I also are have... Are you in a program at this time? At, yeah. At this, at this, in this story? Yes. All right. Failing miserably. But oh. yeah, still right. there. I'm like a hang on no matter what. So yes, in a food program. And so my intention was to not pick up, of course. Yeah. Uh, and what I guess it doesn't, so really what happened was what I, what I, when you asked specifically what I was feeling yeah. a few minutes before I picked up was sad, angry that I read an email that, that assaulted, you know, it was very assaulting. And what I did is what I did with my drinking also is I started eating at him to, to punish myself. Like I, all right, all right. that's a conclusion. What were, what were you thinking? I was thinking if I eat, I'm going to feel different. Yes. And, and it's true. What did, and, you, what did you mean by that in your own, but, but in, in retrospect, it's hard to unwind it when you were actually there. But when you say, I'm going to feel, I'm going to think differently, what, what were you attempting to accomplish? To, to black out, to oh. not feel anything. Uh, okay. All right. To go numb. Yeah. Just like when I drink and use. So uh -huh. the correlation of the, it, it doesn't, it's when you talk now about, it doesn't matter addiction. It doesn't, I'm the same human being with the same faults and frailties. It's just showing its head this way. Yep. The dynamic underneath is the same. The context and the vocabulary is different. But underneath, it's all the same. Yeah. 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 So, boy, did it take me a while to sit with what I was really feeling before I picked up. Because yeah. I was really, to be honest with you, I've been sitting here for the last, well, for many weeks we've been doing this going, well, I've been sober 30 years. Yeah. It reminds me of that um, Jeff um, Redkin, Scott Redkin, who passed yeah. when he went to FA or he went to OA and he was like 200 pounds sober. And they're like, yeah, but your AA bucks don't count here. You're fat. Sit down. You know, <laughs> it was like, oh, so I. Uh, I'm finding knowing that I'm with everyone on this road. I might just have the courage to sit and feel what it was, what I was thinking or feeling. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't want to interrupt your, uh, your reading. Do you have more that you would like to uh, share with us? No, I just, I basically it was just the story of the emails and I was right. wanted to feel different. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, so you were sad. 
So you had some type of a negative thing and you wanted to change that. Yeah. And how much mm, did you have any absence at, at that point? I did. I had, um, then I had been almost 30 days again. Right. Abstinent. Mm -hmm. And when you, what did you mm, eat? Oh, it's fabulous. I ate a chocolate chip cookie. That's good, all right? At least you have quality. But anyway, no. Uh, uh, so uh, as you were picking up the cookie or going over to the plate even before you picked it up, but as you were going over to the plate, what were you conscious of in connection to your 30 days of abstinence and or your commitment to abstinence and or your program? Conscious of my program, nothing. I didn't think... I was obsessed by then I was yeah. I was drowned in the story of I'm a victim this is never going to change yeah. see I think drowned is a great word you're drowned in it and you can't see the truth but you are feeling the feeling and you know what changes that feeling yes and there's no real perspective on it there's no much thought on it and and it's only afterwards that you know you're you're eating at him you're, you're not consciously eating at him right now you're just feeling this sadness and negativity and you want it to stop yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and and so once you had that experience you never did that again right i never stopped doing that until i got honest again that's right. That's right. I couldn't, it was as if, you know, it's like, I just couldn't stop after that. I had let. But see, what's wrong with you? You seem to be a educated and bright lady. And why don't you learn from your mistakes? If yeah. it were only that easy. <laughs> and, and in fact, it's not. In fact, it's impossible. It's not just hard. It's impossible. What does powerless mean? It means I'm hopeless. On my own power, I'm helpless. At least this is the tenant and the and the and the approach in the big book. It's kind of like that's why Bill concludes on page 43. We have no effective mental defense. We need a power other than ourself. And then with regard to unmanageability, on page 62, that second paragraph, he said, and we can't even reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. From my standpoint, that's when we're launched into step two. Yeah. That's the conclusion. To, I'm giving you kind of a, a peak preview of uh, the conclusion to unmanageability, the spiritual malady. Very powerful. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. My story is also that I've got almost 17 years in AA and I'm also um, working a food program and that's what I'm focusing on relating um, with this step one. Okay. And, and what oh, specifically mm -hmm. are we about in terms of addition, uh, addiction, sugar, okay, and so flour. You're, you're talking about an eating disorder kind of a fellowship you're in. Yes, because you've said you're in AA, and I just want to know what perspective are you coming from. Also, how how long have you been in a twelve step fellowship for food? At the point that you're going to give one us year, a one year. Okay, and did you have any abstinence at that point? I. At that point, I only had a few days back. Well, no, no. So the answer is... Oh, yes. <laughs> I, had, I had a few days of abstinence. Yes. All right. So yep. I want everybody to listen to my questions. My questions are very specifically worded, and I want you to respond in a specific way to my question. Yeah. Okay. No, it, it's a training thing that I'll be doing with you for a while. I'll, okay. I'll... Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> I was thinking my first abstinence was long and successful. So that to me was the real abstinence. And then trying to get back is just like failure after failure. But, now, are you saying, when you say that, are you saying your first abstinence in your eating disorder program? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm almost more interested in that. 
than the example that you're about to read us. But let's do this one first and see where it goes. Okay. So um, you're you're back in an eating program. I'm back in. I have a sponsor. I have support. I've got three or four or five days of absence. I've got three or four or five days. I have to drive my son from Flagstaff back to UCLA. Sure. I prepare my meals for two days. I'm going to stay in LA and um, staying in a guest house, have all my food, takes forever to make it all. And, but it's done, it's packed, it's in a cooler. I get to the guest house and the hostess says, I'm barbecuing tonight, will you please join us? Which in my first abstinence, it would not have been a problem. I would have said, actually, I have my own food. I would love to sit with you guys, something. It would have been okay. But I just found myself people pleasing this woman and her 12 year old daughter sat down, ate their dinner. Then the little girl comes out with her cupcakes that she absolutely is like, I made these for you, you know, and it all went out the window, Herb. Right, right. So, um, how long had you been abstinent in the long period? Eight, mo eight months. Oh, okay, good. A good long stretch of eight months. And yep. how, long, how long were you out of the program in relapse? Three, three months. Okay, so a good long period in between. Yep. And, and why did you come back to the program after three months of freedom? I gained 15 pounds. <laughs> okay. I saw, I tried the controlled drinking, controlled eating. I gained 15 pounds. What, what, were you suffering in gaining the weight or you just were embarrassed oh, like the way? I got scared because I saw the road. I saw where the road was leading back to my original weight. Okay. Okay. So if you were to give me one sentence as to why you came back to your 12 step eating pro program, what, what would be that one sentence? I conceded that I'm powerless once I start eating and the, abs and, and I'm sorry, I'm trying one no, sentence. No, that's great. And, and if you were to give me one sentence as to the real motive for coming back to the 12 step program, what was driving you? What was moving you back to the 12 step program? Peer pressure. <laughs> Peer pressure? Did you say? Yes. Yes. Meaning what? What does that mean? All my support sisters and, you know, in the program were like, when are you coming back? What? I think, no. I... Oh, no, that's not peer pressure. That's outreach and you're knowing they're, they're, they're the truth. That's not Thanks. peer pressure. Okay, no, that. I mean, at the, at the surface of it is, but underneath it, no, that's a wonderful, that, you, you uh, I hope, are really grateful for their outreach. Yeah, yeah, all right. But what I'm hearing is that you didn't like the weight and you knew you could come back and do the right body size. So it's really about body size and weight. That's what I'm hearing on the surface of it. Right. And what my mind, my best thinking is you weren't 200 pounds overweight. You were only, you know, 35, 40 pounds. You're not like these people. You don't sit in a closet and eat, yeah. you know. I can manage this with I got a this. little bit of help. Beautiful. All right. So you're back in a few days and you have a sponsor. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she said to you, we're doing the barbecue, what were you conscious of uh, before you ever left your room, after she gave you that invitation? <sighs> I just didn't want to, I just, I just wanted to go home. I was, I, I was, I just, I hate, I felt like I had to make her happy and not make waves. Okay. All right. So there was a people pleasing there in the same way that you talked about your community of people who are reaching out to you. You, there was a component of even people pleasing there in terms yeah. of peer pressure. Yes. Know. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm just looking, I'm surfacing some of the dynamics here in your, in your thinking. Yeah. I didn't want to, 
have a relapse with food with salmon and asparagus. You know, I didn't, it wasn't something I wanted. It was great to me, but anyway. <laughs> it's delicious, but it wasn't what I had. <laughs> so, so as you're eating, before you, as you sat down to the table, what were you thinking in terms of your sponsor, your abstinence, your relapse, your commitment? What were you thinking? I just kept thinking about the phone call in the morning that I was going to have to make. Oh, so you were conscious of the phone call you were going to make and you ate thinking about that. Instead of making a call first. Oh, no, yes. I, no you were lost. You were lost, I was at lost. Place before that. Yeah, no, the trigger had been pulled. The bullet was fired. And um, anything else is just the rest of the story. Yeah, okay. That's, I mean, that's very specific. All right. So out of all of that and our conversation, what's, what's now your kind of experience with it? It's exactly everything we've just read in the book. It's all about the mental, the, the, the mind, what I'm trying to tell myself. And now I can't find it in the book, but it's everything you've said. It not, is not, not your knowledge or your place in the book or a quote from the book, but I was asking you for your experience with this story that you've told us about. It's real life for you. You had some period of eight months. You yeah, left yeah. for three months. You gained weight and you really were uncomfortable with all of that. For lots of mixed reasons, you came back to the program. You got a sponsor. You have some abstinence and... You crashed and burned. My mind is so filled right now. It's hard to just get the essence of what I'm trying to say. But I understand now that it's... Out of the, your mind? Wait, 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 wait. Yep, wait. sorry. For your experience, not your knowledge. Very, very different. So what is your heart and gut doing right now? Other than panicking to get the right answer. <laughs> and there's no right answer. It's... Conf it's my... my my heart and gut says, I've got to turn this one over to God because I'm not getting it on my own. And it's becoming more confusing and more um, spiraling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if in fact you're becoming confused and a little boggled with even your work you're doing and the conversation we're having, for me, that's a sign of an experience and, and an open mind, an opening mind. Because there's not a lot of clear. This is subtle. The subtle insanity that precedes the first drink. This is subtle. It's so subtle. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Anything Thank else? you, Herb. No. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank right. you. I've got about seven hours of abstinence right now. Seven hours. Hours. Wow. Yeah, well, you're down to the hours. All right. So what's the longest period prior to this that you had of abstinence? About a year. Oh, you had a year abstinence. Okay. Can you go back uh, to the relapse and tell us about the context of that and what you relapsed with and what your thinking was at that time? Yes. Um, it was around Thanksgiving. It's the end of November, and that's the time that my father passed away, and it's about two weeks before my mother's birthday, and she had passed away as well. So it's kind of like a time where I sometimes get a little sad thinking about both my parents. All right. Um, what I was thinking about what I ate specifically, I know because I almost always eat the same thing. I ate uh, chips and pretzels. Well, but, but that's, uh, that's the conclusion. And so I need a little bit more of the story that led up to that. Uh, oh, where, where, wait, wait. Where, uh, so where were you when you ate chips and pretzels? I was at home. And were you by yourself? Yes. All right. And at the end of the day or the middle of the day or the beginning of the day? I don't remember specifically the time of the day. I'm retired, so... I don't remember specifically the time of the day. I know that helps me. You're you're retired, so it doesn't actually matter. Um, what were you thinking, or conscious of, or feeling? A year abstinent before you engaged in the chips and the pretzels. I was uncomfortable, feeling uncomfortable, um, missing my parents. Yeah. 
I was also feeling uncomfortable because I have a tape recorder that plays in my head frequently. Okay. You better not break. This is down on a long time. Can you hold on another minute, another day? I had, was thinking about uh, and, and nervous about whether I could hold on in program. Hold on to what? No, that's where I got lost, I guess. Hold on to what? To, to the program itself. Well, to, why were you thinking that thought? Um, the thoughts come in my head sometimes that this is going really well. You're going to screw it up. Okay. Um, did that's, you have that thought at that point? Yes. All right. All right. And, um, and, and I'd had that thought for several days. Okay. And, and I, you had talked to your sponsor about that? I had talked to my sponsor about it. Yeah, I did. Okay. All right. I did talk to my sponsor about it. All right. I didn't like the response I got. But what was that? Um, basically, are you going to let that be the reason why you have a break? Are you going to let that get in your way? So you mean he, 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 he called you on it? Yeah, I guess he called me on it. Yeah, because you were already warming up. Yeah. Mm, I'm really sad. It's an anniversary of two deaths. And, and, uh, and I wanted some love. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, and I want some love from my sponsor. And he just tells me the truth that I'm using that as a potential excuse. Right. Yeah, and I don't like having my covers pulled back. No. <laughs> Nobody does, by the way. <laughs> All right, and so tell me, um, where were the pretzels and the chips? In the supermarket. Oh, you had to go out and buy it? Yes. Oh, so were you at home when you had the thought? Yes. And did you walk or drive? Drive. Okay, so as you got in your car to go to the supermarket, your intention was to get chips and pretzels? Yes, that was my intention, but that's not what I was telling myself. If, if Talk to me about what you were talking to yourself about. I was telling myself, I'm not going to go get those things, but I do need to get some fruit for tomorrow for my meal plan. So I'm just going to go and I'm going to get the fruit and I'm going to stick with what's on my little shopping list. I have a little, and, and I'm going to leave. That's what I was telling but you're you. you're already conscious that there's a struggle going on. Oh, the struggle is a light word. There's an out, oh. out and out fight going on. Okay. It's knock down, drag them out fight. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Well, of course, that's a fight you're going to lose every time. Every time. Right. Right. Okay. All right. And um, prior to, so this is now at the, uh, at the conclusion of a year's abstinence, Prior to having that year's abstinence, had you ever had that kind of dynamic and that kind of thinking and that kind of struggle before? Before coming in the program, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and how did that turn out? Any time that you... Yeah. Well, I, I just went and got what I wanted to get because it didn't last very long because I didn't have a consciousness of... Yeah. of All right. It's like, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, just go ahead and get this and eat it and be done with it. Right, right, so, right. I All right, so well, let's let's explore that for just a minute. I don't know where this is going, but let's explore that for a minute. Prior to coming into the program, you would go get what you wanted to eat and eat it. How did that turn out for you? Well, it didn't turn out well. I ended up a type two diabetic for high blood pressure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So even more uh, consequences. Very big time negative consequences. Yes. You've got a lot of information going for you after a year as abstinence. A lot, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So why did why didn't you go to the store and manage your list? I gave up. It's like just like your sponsor predicted. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All it's right. Like, it's like I can't. I was like, I'm going to do this. Screw, screw everything. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you purchased the chips and the pretzels and you got back in your car. Did you wait till you got home? Yes, because I put them in the trunk, so I had to wait. 
All right. Oh, that was my that was my manageability moment. Wow. Wow. How, see, you're pretty conscious then at that point. I'm always conscious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's my challenge. And you got home and you took him in and the rest is history. Right. I can right. barely get in the house at that point. All right. Yeah. The, the point of it is each of you challenge yourself with that level of specificity when you're coming to grips with what am I thinking? What am I feeling? Because this man in my third visit to him on this very topic, we had spent two two-hour sessions beforehand. In this two-hour session, he did what I'm doing here. That's why I'm doing it, because it was so effective for me. And I saw, I came to a point where I oh my God. On Monday, I said I wasn't going to drink Monday night, and I drank. On Tuesday, I said, I'm not going to drink for Tuesday, and I drank all the way through Friday. And up till then, I had the consciousness that I was changing my mind. But I'm smarter than that. I'm more knowledgeable than that. I'm more disciplined than that. So clearly, I wasn't changing my mind. My mind was being changed. And it went from my decision to a concession of my powerlessness. It wasn't a decision. I was being hijacked by an obsession. I, I don't explain it. I just observe it. Can you relate to that? I'm still trying to understand when, the, you know, we talk about that five minutes before. Usually for me, it could be, a half hour, hour, hour and a half, two hours. But I'm not, I'm not attempting to have anybody understand that there's a time when you're conscious enough to manage your consciousness. That's not it at all. Okay. The, this information that you have mm -hmm. is useless. Okay. When it comes to preventing the obsession. Right. No, no, you have to really, I know you're hearing it, but everybody here, this information is important only to tease out in you the experience that this information is useless. Mm. Well, what does Bill say? At the at page 43, there come a time and a place where there'll be absolutely no effective mental defense. This information is useless as a protection against the obsession, what it is useful for is to give me an experience of the powerlessness, no choice, so that I will put more energy into seeking power, not seeking information, not seeking consciousness, but seeking a power other than myself, because I'm hopeless and helpless in this area. That's frightening. For me, that was my response to it. I had 24 to 48 hours of abject terror and fear. I was seven years sober, and I had this sense, this overriding internal sense of impending doom. That's right, yeah? Because I, I just saw that, oh my God, all my step work, all my knowledge is not going to protect me. The only thing I can hope for is an effective relationship with God, and I cannot produce that. Bingo. Yeah, bingo. I've been trying. Yeah. My own spiritual director said, Herb, you're, he wasn't in a program. We were talking about meditation. He said, you're as powerless over your spiritual life as you are over alcohol. Think this thought. You're as powerless over your meditation as you are over alcohol, having no power at all. Sit in the presence of power humbled by your powerlessness and hoping for a connection with power. It, it turned my whole meditation practice around. He said, I'm responsible for the effort and the results are none of my business. Yeah. Okay. And that's what we get to do is we get to show up and do the best we can knowing it's not the best we can and doing it anyway.
you, you shared you're as powerless over your spiritual condition as you are over your alcohol. Yeah. And I never heard you say that. And um, if you could elaborate a little bit on in five-year-old English. Brock. Well, no, I understand what you're saying. It, it was a startling moment for me. I was five years sober, 1989. I was sitting in front of a wonderfully spiritual man, very experienced, not in the program at all. I explained to him, 12-step program, my experience with working the steps, my experience with step one powerlessness over alcohol, and that I worked the balance of the steps, and I began to change. And uh, I came to step 11, and I understood it finally for the very first time, and that I was practicing it every day now for a year. I'm sitting in front of him because I'm bored with the practice. And he said to me, Herb, you're a task-oriented person. You can figure out how to do things, and you've got a lot of discipline and energy, and you wrestle it to the ground. Spirituality is not like that, and neither is meditation. You're as powerless over your spirituality as you are over alcohol. He got the parallel. He, he actually didn't know anything about 12 Steps. He didn't know anything about the Big Book or Bill Wilson. But underneath the dynamic that Bill understood and wrote about in the Big Book and the 12 Steps, underneath that dynamic, the dynamic's the same no matter where you are in a spiritual tradition. Bill says you're powerless over managing your own life on your own power. I mean, that's the whole point of the second half of the first step. We haven't seen that yet, but we will in the next couple, three weeks. On page 62, Bill says, we can't even reduce it much by wishing or trying on our own power. We can't reduce our self-centeredness. I relate that to spirituality. So this man's insight and instinct from his own spiritual journey and experience and tradition was able to help me understand the 12-step experience and tradition when he said, you're as powerless over your spiritual life as you are over alcohol having no power at all. You're as powerless over your meditation as you are over alcohol having no power at all sit in the presence of power, humbled by your powerlessness. Your job is to show up. Your job is not to leave early. Your job is the effort and the results are none of your business. It was profound. It was life-changing. Because I am a task-oriented person. But spirituality is not a task I can accomplish. I lean gently into the program. I lean gently into the steps. I lean gently into the spirit. And the spirit, figuratively, poetically, places the, the, its arms around me and draws me forward. But you see the cooperation there. You see the collaboration there. I use the word co-creation. It's my job to show up and lean into the spirit. The moment I do that, the spirit draws me forward. And I connect with lean gently, keep on the path and be humble. And uh, Well, even, even on that, yes, um, I can't keep on the path on my own power. And I certainly can't be humble on my own power. The mm -hmm. moment I recognize my humility, I am out of it. No kidding. <laughs> so if I'm on my knees and get my face to the ground trying to be as humble as possible <laughs> but still uh, your ego is having so much fun with its with its power to assume humility look at how humble i am with my knees bent and my face to the ground oh my god i better get a special admiral's stripe for humility <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, no, subtle, subtle, baffling and cunning and whatever the words are from the big book. 
it talks about alcohol. That's that's really my ego there too. Yeah, and it may or may not be true for you. No, you probably nailed it. I just wasn't aware. Yeah. I didn't know what I didn't, didn't know. I don't you know, uh, Teresa of Avila is one of the Catholic saints from the 16th century. A woman, a brilliant, brilliant woman, um, wrote several books. Anyway, she said, humility is truth. Humility is truth. Just accepting reality as it is. It's brilliant. It's so simple. Humility is truth. Just seeing reality as it is, not as I project it to be, or certainly not want it to be. Yeah. And I had had months of abstinence. I'm in OA. And I had a big slip since the last session, since last week. And I can't get back on track. Okay. And, and I feel all right, like... So, all right. So um, I don't want to interrupt your... No, but I do want you ahead. to focus. I want you to focus. Sure. So you had some abstinence before that. How much time did you have? This go round about two months. Wonderful. Two months of abstinence. And uh, this last week, you broke your abstinence before. One minute to five minutes before you picked up. What were you thinking or feeling or aware of? It's hard for me to remember. I know what I thought it's last week. Only time. this week. It's not hard for you to remember. Okay. It's yeah. not hard. Okay. Get over yourselves. I'm not going to allow that kind of talk. It's not hard. Yeah, it might take a little effort and re reflection. If it was 20 years ago, I'd be a little easier. But within a week? No, uh-uh. It is, and, and I mean, after two months of abstinence and you break, I want to know what you were thinking and feeling or not thinking and feeling one to five minutes. Tell me about the circumstances and what did you break with? I ate, it doesn't sound that bad. I ate a frozen banana. But it's not on the list, right? No, it's not. Right. I ate it in the middle of the night. Yeah. It, and uh, what I was thinking all right. All right. Yeah. was I can't. I can't stay in my skin. I can't live with this. I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. What were you uncomfortable about? Dealing with intimacy issues in my therapy. Okay. And, and were you asleep and woke up or were you just not yes. able to go to sleep? No, I was asleep and I woke up, which is a pattern for me. Mm -hmm. And you woke up and you're uncomfortable. Have you ever, uh, you say it's a pattern, so when you have awakened before and uh, being disturbed, uh, um, how, how, how frequent is that in, a, in, your, in your pattern, in your cycle? Right now, it's happening several times a night. Oh. Okay. Um, when I started and was abstinent, I would wake up maybe once a night. But food was maybe a fleeting thought, but I didn't entertain it. Okay. No, that's, that's not evading. That's a very clear and specific answer. That's great. Um, so now that you've relapsed, you're saying that you have um, very disturbed sleep. Yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, before that, though, as you were having the two months of abstinence, what was the pattern like of your sleep? much more restful were you waking up with any type of disturbance yes i would wake up but i wasn't uncomfortable in my skin i knew that if i was anxious i could put my head back on the pillow and i would fall asleep okay so um this particular night this last week you were disturbed when you woke up and you could really feel the disturbance had you ever been that disturbed before in um abstinence yes um was that a regular occurrence no previously? no it would be very infrequent all right but let's assume that you had it infrequently did it always lead to relapse no. So what was different this time? Well, this is why I wanted to talk with you Good. because 
I was explaining my relapse to myself as saying that my spiritual practice was weak this past week. Mm. And why it was, I was feeling pressure. I was becoming very obsessed with work and mm. worried about it. And I let my spiritual practice wane. Mm -hmm. So, and specifically, what does that mean? What does sp uh, waning spiritual practice for you mean? For instance, uh, last week, first day back at a job, meditating for 10 minutes, but aware of, I had 10 minutes and I I'd never kind of let myself be in the presence. It was like, um, okay, I've now check off the list. I did 10 minutes kind of thing. And prayer that way, very rushed, not thinking about it, really not being in it. And this is what's happened to me before when I've lost my abstinence. I, I um, get caught up in life crazies and I, I forget that I need to be quiet. And if I don't, it seems like that's when I lose my abstinence. I live in a spiritual shield. If I, for some reason, if I slacken up, Bill calls it rest on our laurels. If I slacken on my spiritual practices, the shield gets weak, that, gets yeah. vulnerable, not me my shield, which is a power other than me and my relationship with it, yeah. it gets weak, it gets thin, it drops out, it becomes vulnerable and the obsession comes in and that seems like what you're attempting to um, describe here as your experience. So that you were giving short shrift to your meditation and prayer. I'm a little concerned uh, about the conclusion because it's not about your effort and it's not about your feeling and it's not about your knowledge because it sounds like you were there doing the best you could in that 10 minutes but for some reason you also feel like you were becoming intentionally distracted with your work and allowed that to kind of hijack you that's a very good description that's exactly what i did well it's what you it's my words but it's what you said yeah, but I'm not sure I, I was allowing my conscious to process it. Oh, that way. oh, well, there is nobody. I don't believe there's anybody on the call that would disagree that what I just said was just a repeat in my words of what you said. No, I, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so um, it might be that you're judging yourself a little harshly, and I'd be careful there. But it, it's a possible explanation. Also, um, during this week, are you calling a sponsor, talking about your concern about work? I did reach out. I haven't heard from her. So you called, but you didn't talk to her. No, I did not. All and right. I emailed so, her. Yeah. So that's another possible problem. Um, you maybe you if if your sponsor is busy or periodically unavailable, you might want to have a backup plan so that there is somebody else that you can have a literal conversation with in contact. I did do that last night. I did a mini fear inventory with a, a, a friend. Yep, perfect, wonderful. And then um, in this last week, have you been helpful to anybody intentionally? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the one thing that may be the worm in the wood here is that you got, you got a little bit lazy with your meditation practice. It's a pattern for me. Oh, well, all right. Let's, I heard that and I forgot that you had said that. Tell me about what you're seeing here as a pattern. I have had abstinence one time for about two years. Mm -hmm. And every time when I get comfortable in it, I, I pull back. I don't invest as much. And I start worrying about Oh, I don't know, life, relationships, whatever. Okay. And I, um, I feel like I put that between me and God. Or higher well, power. no, you just said you did. Yeah. You, and you have a pattern of getting I distracted do. and getting complacent. I do. Yeah. 
And that's, again, the big book on page 85 said, we cannot rest on our laurels. And what it means is our past accomplishments. What it means is our yesterday's spiritual life. We have to have a spiritual life today. And although it's not black and white, I don't want to give any anybody the sense that there's a formula here and I've got to do it perfectly by the numbers. Otherwise, you know, the hammer is going to fall. No, I don't mean that at all. Um, but you have to interpret what does it mean rest on your laurels and complacency. If you have a pattern that you see, then what is it that you could do differently? Well, I wasn't being honest with you and myself just now. Okay. I did do a mini inventory yesterday, but I didn't do that last week when this first happened. Okay. So when, when it first when I had the first compulsion, that was the time to pick up the phone. And if my sponsor wasn't available to find someone else, I did not do that. Yeah. I just stayed in my craziness. Um, yeah. And then we're connecting to the 10th step. When you're disturbed or in your craziness, there's several items that need to be done. Number one is pray. Number two is talk to somebody. That's the second item in the re in the recommendation in the 10 step. Make an amend if you've harmed somebody, which doesn't sound like you did, um, but and turn your thoughts to helping somebody else. So essentially, those are the two questions that I ask people. How is your meditation practice? Uh, three questions, uh, a prayer. And uh, did you talk to somebody? And did you help somebody? Those are the three basically building blocks uh, to maintain your spiritual shield. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And, and, and so you're on a consciousness here, aware of a cycle and a, uh, you called it a, um, what did you call it? Um, a pattern? No, you, you Yes, I did. I called it a pattern. All right. Um, yeah. And so you might want to really take a look at the pattern and see what was happening in the hour before or the day or the week before the pattern kicked in again. Because it's not about the one or five minutes. By then it's probably too late, but I want to make people conscious of it. A good friend of mine said, the drink is not the relapse. The drink is the evidence of a relapse that took place yesterday or last week or last month. And so when you have a cycle or a pattern like that, take a look at the bigger picture on the pattern and see what you're thinking, feeling, and doing. Thinking, feeling, and doing in the, in the, in the time before the cycle kicks in. Because there's something amiss there if it's, a, if it's a defined and definable pattern or cycle. Okay. Yeah? Thank you. That was a great conversation. Thank you so much. I have many stories, and so I was thinking about just one of them over the past week, which was after I'd been abstinent for about 11 months, I guess, and I was, I think, on step nine at the time, and it was Rosh Hashanah, and I had gone to a high holiday luncheon, which is like 5 p.m. or something, and, you know, people said blessing over the wine and then blessing over the bread, and they were passing around challah for people right. to take a bite of. And kala is not something I can eat. I have many, many, many memories of binging on an entire loaf of kala, you know, in 24 hours. Sure. Um, and they're passing around the kala. And I just remember really two things. One was that I was very uncomfortable at the idea of being the only person not partaking. Right. And then having the thought that it's only a bite of kala. Exactly. It's only a bite. Like, I'll be fine. It's only yeah. a bite. Yeah. And it started a six month long relapse yeah. um, that fortunately thus far has been my final relapse. Cause I think yeah. I really got scared after the end of that yeah. six yeah. month binge, yeah. but, um, but it, it was, it's just been interesting for me to think about like for so long, I don't think I got the Jim and the Fred stories at all. And yeah. now I can see, I have so many of those stories and they're so simple. They're, you know, I just want to yeah. buy a Paula or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and they're 
they're so uh, they replicate themselves in different circumstances, but underneath it's the same story. Oh, I don't want to be seen as different or, oh, it's just not a big deal this time. Or I got this one. Oh my God, I've heard that thousands of times, those three little words and phrases. Mm -hmm. So I just was grateful to have the opportunity to think about it as a hijacking. That was just a helpful yeah. new layer of nuance for me. That was really helpful. Well, because the word is so dramatic, mm -hmm. and we today really understand that word in terms of the outside civilization or outside of ourselves. Um, and when we bring that in, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, there are forces in me that I'm not controlling at all, that uh, I literally have no influence over. Yeah. I just, I need to have the spiritual shield. I, I just... I've fallen in love with Star Wars and the image from um, um, that movie, uh, Hidden Figures. Mm. If you haven't seen it, it's very worthwhile about uh, three women who were basically anonymous at NASA, and they basically rose up because of their competency to be extremely useful and helpful in the the launching of and the satellite and all the rest of that. But I got, I got the idea. Well, Bill uses that in 1939 in, in, on page 25. He said, we're rocketed into a fourth dimension. So we really can use the steps in an analogy of a rocket ship. All right. Mm. And, and the Star Wars image is where the mothership, the big starship, has a protective shield around it, and it's invulnerable to being attacked unless the shield is weak or down. And, and I thought, well, that's just like us. If the shield is weak, we can, it can be penetrated by the obsession. If the shield is down, well, then hell, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm subject to being hijacked, certainly. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's images like that that help me not only understand my own deficiencies, but mm, the motivation for some of aspects of my program, but it also allows me to communicate it to other people so that they can kind of hear it differently. That's really the point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that shield metaphor. Thank you. That's actually yeah. super helpful too. Thank you very much. And what I heard, it was like, I need power. It's done onto us. Um, and my head is going, so what's the point? So what's the use? You mean there's nothing I can do? And oh, then no. People never, 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 never said that. No, no, my head that, is saying. That's, my why, head that's is why I'm saying. here. That's why you're here. Because there is mm -hmm. something that you can do about your relationship with power, there's nothing that you can do about your relationship with addiction. You hear the difference? Right. No, you don't. Okay, come on. Talk to me some more. Um, I was thinking about what you said, because then I also hear uh, people in program for 10 and over years, chronic relapses and... Um, and I'm like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that. I, what's the point of doing all this? So that's where my head is like, you know, am I going to be here in 10 years from, from now? Well, how about, so, are you going to be here 10 minutes from now or 10 days from now or 10 weeks from now? You don't know that. But how do you want to live now? Definitely with power or free or without addiction. But I'm a chronic, uh, not chronic, I'm a periodic binger. Yeah. And so when it happens, I feel bad. And then I pick myself up and I'm fine for a few weeks. Do you want to continue that cycle? Well, you see, I don't want to be a chronic relapser. And I want what you have. But then it's like, when is that going to happen? And you mean... I'm when did I say... You. Wait, wait, wait. Great questions. When did I say it would happen? Step nine. 
That's Why right. You're listening. At the end of step nine, it's guaranteed. At the when you finish your step nine amends, it's guaranteed in the book. It's and it's my observation a hundred percent. People who finish the ninth step get free of their addiction, stay free as long as they do 10, 11, and 12 on a consistent daily basis. So what about the people that have done the steps time and time again and they're still relapsing? I, I can't explain that. I mean, I would love to sit down with them and ask them the kind of questions that I ask specifically. I bet you I find the worm in the wood someplace. Oh, I've done the steps, really? Let's talk about your fourth step. Did you actually analyze your beliefs? Did you actually identify your motives? Did you actually identify your deep resentments and form a prayer practice for the removal of your deep resentments? And they're looking at me like a deer in headlights because they've never heard that language. Am I speaking Greek or what? No, I'm speaking the process that you all are going to experience that are going to give you freedom from your resentments. But the, right. big book, the big book doesn't have any of the words that I just said other than deep resentment. Because all, my, my experience is all an interpretation and an expansion of a deeper uh, experience with the, the book, the, the, the instructions in the big book. The instructions in the big book are wonderful, but they're not intuitive. They're wonderful, but they're not complete. Right. Yeah. So... Going back, I mean, you're wonderfully conscious. You're very much paying attention. You're asking some great questions. And uh, you said, I don't want to have, you don't have to wait. You can show up and do this work if you want what the book promises and what you see witnessed in my words and my behavior. If you want that, it's available to you, but not by next Friday. Maybe a year from today, maybe six months from today. I don't know when the gift will happen. I guarantee you the gift will happen. And I can say that now without any qualifications because I've got 25 years of experience of doing these workshops. Yeah. yeah. Because there was a lot of discussion about ego today. And, and mm. as we're talking, I, I'm thinking, is this now the ego t trying to come in and say, you know what, you're better off without so. it? No, I, I think you're just a smart person who's very reflective and you're challenging yourself. These, your questions are not ego questions. Your questions are really fundamental, really solid questions. They're not silly questions. They're not, no, they're really good questions. And, and you need to challenge yourself that way. That's right. And then, then be patient with the fact that you may not feel satisfied with your answer or mine. <laughs> you may not be, feel satisfied, you may, but you're going to have faith in the process and you're going to have faith and hope in me. Okay. Yeah? Thank you. It's a, it's a leap. It's a leap. What do you got to lose? Exactly. Yeah. You know, show up for and do the work in between and see what happens in a year. Okay. Yeah. If you mark Thank your you. calendar. Yeah. This is my challenge I give every once in a while. If you keep a calendar for next year already or make a note yourself and make a note in uh, middle of February of next year. Valentine's Day. Woo, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> February 14th. Put on your calendar. Herb and I had a conversation on 9 11, 2020. Yes. And he said, yes. by now, February 14th of 2021, I will really appreciate the work that he suggested. I will. That's the promise. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to it. That's great. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Yeah. To embrace the mystery. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to do that in the meditation. And it became such a beautiful thing for me to embrace the presence that I could finally call a mystery. I didn't have to figure out what it looked like. I didn't have to figure out 
how it communicated. I didn't have to have an image of it, nothing. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was the most beautiful thing. And to be able to go into that space and all I needed to do was feel the presence and do nothing. Or not feel the presence and do nothing. Exactly. Because it's not about feeling. It's great when you feel it, but when you just say, it's a mystery and I don't know it and I don't feel it, it's a mystery and I believe it and I'm going to sit here as if it's true. Exactly. That's and really, when the magic begins to happen, by the way. And it has. I mean, yeah, yeah. to just consent and say, I am here, I'm waiting, I'm here, yeah. and being open. And, and so because I've been able to do that, yeah. what's transferred was I was able to embrace that my body is a mystery too. Yeah. And, and that I can be in that space and have it be okay has been yeah. just the biggest blessing. And, right. and um, yeah. it's great. Well, especially, especially if you're in OA. I mean, I heard that for the very first time from you just now. And I, I love it because I've been exposed to the eating disorder programs. There's eight of them, I think, um, since 12 years ago. And um, I'm, I'm experienced now from my exposure externally, but it's still a mystery to me. And so what you've helped me is that the body in this area is a really big mystery in the eating disorder. I can explain addiction in, in substance addiction and sometimes even in process addiction. But when it comes to food addiction, I, I start losing words and losing confidence because it's just so tricky and it's so individual. I love it. There's a mystery involved with that that I don't have to know. I don't have to explain. I observe it. It's mischievous mystery. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Well, I wanted, to, I wanted to share an experience that I had over the weekend. Yeah. Um, because while I have abstinence from Googling anything, I have abstinence from <laughs> doing any of that for only about three weeks, honestly. Yeah. That's good. And don't yeah, don't it, change it. Don't say only. Well, it was incredible to, yeah. to uh, disengage from the behavior. Yeah, yeah. And the peace and serenity that came as a result from my standpoint that's a classic formula oh i surrendered i heard and accepted direction and i took action exactly and no, no, was, no. the dynamic underneath that is all the same yeah. yeah yeah right exactly i surrendered even though i was terrified and um that's correct so, by the way i surrendered even though i was terrified yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was really scared. Yeah. And, um, and so I was free of the, this obsession. And it came up again this last weekend. I was with my mom um, who has dementia. I felt the feeling like I was irked. And, and, then, the, and then the next thought was, it must have something to do with vitamins and minerals because doctors don't study vitamins and minerals. So that was the first thought. And I thought, and then the second thought was she's probably low in B12. And then I stopped it. I heard the B12 and I just went, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I, no. No, no, you, you, you stopped it because you're, re, you're not responsible for the first thought, but you are responsible for entertaining it. But you've had the experience that that's a dark rabbit hole and there's nothing down there. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Oh. And I, I, I just... I'm just so uh, grateful that I was able to stop it. Did you talk to anybody about this dynamic that was going on with you? Um, well, that evening, I was out of town, so I was kind of uh, in my own room. I was able to uh, But it sounds write. like it was going on for quite a, several days or weeks even, this research mania that you had. Oh, my God. The research mania has been going on for years. Oh, well, but so now you've unplugged from it. And so I was wondering, what were the ingredients that went into it? Was it just that you surrendered to the fact that you were compulsed and you were tired of it? Yes. Okay. All right. That works for me. Yep. Yes. All right. Yep. Yes. And I, th and I think I increased my shield. I oh. know that that's what happened. Right. Yeah. I increased that other area 
of more of what I want. And I felt like I wanted, and I said this very consciously, I want to go from form and feelings more to love and light and have, you know what I mean? Like from matter yeah. to energy. No, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And I, I'm just so grateful yeah. and so yeah. looking forward to this year yeah. of learning more. I'm yeah. just so, so grateful yeah. to, to you and everyone who's shared on this, yeah. on this class. Yeah. And what you, the, the button you pressed right now in my sort of my poetic and metaphor uh, image is that if you want more light, turn away from the darkness and yeah. walk toward the light. That's what we're doing here. That's what we're doing here. <sighs> Step yeah. three is about turning. Made a decision to turn from what to what. To what is step two, from what is step one. All right? And the turning is step three. We're going we're gonna to have a big, big time unpacking of all of that over the next several weeks and months. I did this workshop and I've been to your live presentations in Maine and, and I had a study, a good study buddy that would, would work through steps 10, 11, and 12 with me. I genuinely believe that I had given it everything I had and I still am struggling. Um, and um, I, I hesitated to even get on the call because I, I don't know what I, I don't know what I want other than that. I'm still hanging in there, believe me. <laughs> I, uh, this is the only direction, the only thread, the only salvation that I'm aware of is um, the work of the program. But I, I feel like somehow or another, I have just, um, Oh, I was going, well, obviously my, 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 my spiritual practice clearly wasn't good enough. The reason I, I, I wanted to come through it again uh, was to deepen my spiritual practice and to have it, because it was very fledgling last year. Right. Um, uh, and I have hesitated to speak because I feel like such a freaking flop. <laughs> and okay um but isn't that the whole point that this isn't a gathering of saints this isn't a, this isn't the mecca of enlightenment this is the outpatient department of the mental hospital <laughs> yep yeah, and we're all inmates yep yeah. Oh my God, it's so true. Oh, well, I and, feel like I am having a crash course in helplessness. I mean, no, big, what uh, a gift. No, what a gift that you have that awareness and that experience. And, and, and I, it's like a whole nother level of helplessness. That's right. Completely. And I, also, in terms of looking at my thoughts just before and so forth, I'm finding so many uh, what are excuses that I have been giving myself that I I didn't even know I was doing, and I and I then I. Uh, but see, the set aside prayer and the work that you're doing is working. Because you're becoming more conscious that you were less conscious. Yeah. And that's really how this works. You said you want more. That's exactly, you heard my story. That's exactly my experience. Mm -hmm. I, I had this experience when I was four years sober, but it took another 12 years going through the work three different times okay. for me to get the, what I consider to be the full enlightenment. Now, I don't mean to discourage anyone. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to know that, that... Well, but here's how it works. 
when you came in last year, you had this level of awareness. Mm -hmm. You did have some awareness, but it was at a diminished level. You did, you did this work and you, your enlightenment, your consciousness went up a whole bunch. Yep. So now when you go through the work, you have more light to see the darkness. And hello, <laughs> it's not fun. Oh, no, it's not fun. Right, exactly. But it's so. But it's okay. It's, I don't know. It's no. It's a gift. It's an answer to a prayer. I'm not a sadist, but I pray that everybody have this experience of helplessness and hopelessness, and a, and a complete awareness that without a power other than ourselves, we're absolutely destitute and lost. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty confident you do. <laughs> Listen, and, and just again, again, the, the gift of awareness and sadness and tears and hopelessness and helplessness, and I use the term gift. I'm not being poetic. No. I'm being theological. <laughs> it's a gift of the spirit. So you just lean into it. Don't, don't get violent at all. And you don't have to get dramatic at all. Just <laughs> lean gently into it. Move forward in the spirit of the set aside. Yeah, can do. I know, I know, I know you can. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. And we'll pick it up next week. We're going to continue to be focused on um, the mind worksheet as you doing this kind of work, hoping to kind of help people have or at least deepen their experience with this no choice an obsession and the insanity of it. Um, go ahead with um, assignment five gently and uh, begin doing it. Um, and then um, next week, I'll give you more instructions on that. Please join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference.